Do you feel comfortable breaking down your own portfolio? But I know we, we've been at it more than an hour, so I hope you still have the minute to talk about that. But sort of breaking down your own portfolio in terms of, um, maybe let's talk about in terms of percentages, because I know that you've got you've got a lot in there. Like you got uranium, but you also have precious, precious metals. You've got shipping, I know you have in there too. So what else? Do, do you feel like breaking it down? Yeah, I can break it down. Um, so... I don't know the exact amounts because I, I haven't really checked my accounts um, lately. So I know approximately, these are just really approximate figures. And um, Okay, well, before you tell me that, then why don't you tell me how yep. you approach it? Because you, you say you don't know it, but how do, you, yep. how do you go in? Like, what do you think? Like, okay, uranium, I just want to buy a little bit more. Or do you, do you think like, okay, I want to make it 20% of my portfolio or 50 or whatever? So, so the way that I've approached my portfolio is I wanted a solid base, which is precious metals, physical precious metals that can't go to zero. So just in case some freak accident or something happens in the markets, I can sell that and, you know, buy up if there are amazing opportunities. And it's most likely that I will never sell it. But if, there, if, if the market markets give me a present, <laughs> um, if, if the market gives me an incredible opportunity, th that's where I can kind of sell my pr physical precious metals and, you know, buy up more stocks. So I want to have a really solid base that can't go to zero. And that's one third of my portfolio is precious, uh, physical precious metals. Yeah. And then I think about one third and during, during the peak, I think uranium reached as high as, you know, something like 40 to 45%. Um, but I think it's about, in terms of cost base, I think it's about one third. And I think um, it's probably around, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly the split, but I think right now the uranium portfolio is maybe one third around there. Um, I don't actually, cost base is a lot lower than one third. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, uranium is one third. I've got oil and gas as well. So oil is probably about, oil and gas around 10%. Um, I've got shipping, which I kept saying was 10%, but it's actually not 10%. It's more like, more like 5%, I think. Um, so I've got all those and I've got like iron ore plays. I've got copper plays. I've got, um, graphene plays. Um, and I've got about 10% in gold mining companies for producers. Hmm. So that's what I have in my portfolio right now. Okay. That's a lot to manage. Yeah. I'm not there yet. I've got precious metals, gold, silver, copper, and uranium. That's pretty much it for me. Um, you, you told me, by the way, I was seeing some pictures that you're uh, you're married. You've got beautiful kids and, and a beautiful family, by the way. So so let me congratulate you on it. Uh, you also seem to be taking good care of them, by the way. So I, uh, I I've got big respect for men that um, can do that continually. So I'm not trying to blow smoke or anything, but definitely a hat tip. Um, how do you how do you manage your risk around those? having a family, I guess is what I'm asking, because I don't, you know, I, you know, I have a wife, sure, but we, we, we live with our, with my parents. It's much easier for me. I don't have kids. I don't even have a dog, even though I really do want to get a dog. But I, I mean, it's, it's all of your money is into this, is on this thesis of commodities going up. You tell me, you know, oil and gas, shipping, uranium, precious metals. So like, do you, do you own real estate and then like a safety net? Is that something that you keep or how do you be beyond the stock market and beyond the, the precious metal or beyond the commodities market? I meant so. Um, real estate, did you say? Yeah. So I don't, I don't have real estate. Um, so I live in Australia where I believe housing prices are quite overvalued. So I don't mm. have a real estate here. Okay. So right now, um, yeah, pretty much all my portfolio is in commodities because I really do believe in this commodities run. And I think when an opportunity like this comes up, I think you really do have to seize it. Um, and so this, as I said, the market conditions that I'm seeing right now in commodities is nothing like I've seen before. And this is a definitely a better setup than what we've seen in 2000s. So that's why I'm like, I'm big on commodities. I think once you see the opportunity, you just have to seize it. So this is the opportunity that I'm trying to seize. Yeah. Well, congratulations for having the guts for it, I guess. So you're following exactly what Rick Rule says. I really hope it pays off for you. I just, I've always, I've always been thinking about this. Like, how would I do this if I have, if, you know, I've got kids, I've got a wife, we've got to live somewhere. Maybe I'm taking care of, you know, my mom's or my dad is getting older. I'm taking care of them or something like that. So how am I, how, how would I manage my portfolio? Something that I've been thinking about going forward. And uh, is that, is that like, how, is that how you plan on investing for, forever? Like, do you think that you'll 
eventually do what 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 I hope to do, which by the way is I guess I guess a lot of other people dream about that too. But just build a strong dividend portfolio that I, that can cover your expenses, and you just put in you know a couple of hours per day managing your own money. You don't have to go to work. You take care of your family. It's secure and all that. Is that is that also what you plan on doing? Uh, I think so. I think that's probably where I like to be. Although I quite like my job as well. I keep saying this, but I quite quite like my job as well. I like interaction with the people, so mm. I don't really mind working at all. Um, but I think I mainly I don't know if I've I've been thinking about this. Why am I like so focused on this? But I think it's the mental stimulation that it gives me, and it's just exciting for me. Like it's learning mm. every day. Um, just exciting to you know look into the markets and interact with you know people. I've only started Twitter last year, I think, um, and only really started posting towards the end of last year or something like that. But I think interaction with the community is also fun, um, and so I think I just yeah I just enjoy I I enjoy the mental stimulation that comes from it, and and to be honest, I don't spend a tremendous amount of time like if you think about it because my strategy is to just buy and hold and sit time so. It's not like I'm trading day in and out and I don't really need to go into the account every day to check what's happening or anything like that. All I'm doing is I probably check like charts once a day or something like that. Um, and the, yeah, like, I mean, I, I'll go through tweets and if there are something, if there's something interesting, I look at it, but it's not like I spend a tremendous amount of time going mm. through like the details of everything every day. So yeah, it's not, it's not too burdensome. Yeah. That makes sense to me. It's um, I like the interaction whenever because I I I'd open up. I I own a small cafe slash bakery over here in Belgium, and so in 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 the, in the mornings that's what we do. My wife we go there six o'clock. We're there till like ten o'clock, um, and I really like the interaction with the people. I, I you know I've always worked in this industry my whole life. I guess I I sort of enjoy that. Even though I'm an accountant by education, I really don't enjoy being an accountant, and uh, but I like the interaction with the people. Yet though. If I really had to have it my complete way, I think that eventually I want to maybe I want to buy sort of like um, an old house that has a, a piece of ground to it where I'm going to live in the house while building my new house sort of in on, on that ground and eventually, you know, use the old house as just some sort of a shack or whatever and be able to, to afford to do that sort of full time and, and sort of have that hobby, if you can call it financed by a dividend portfolio. That's sort of how I imagine my, maybe it's a naive dream. Maybe it's a young guy's thing that, you know, I'm being naive that it's ever going to work, but I, I'm hoping that this is going to get me there. So, yeah. Well, through all your education and learning, I'm yeah, pretty confident yeah. that you'll get there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Again, from your, from, from your mouth to God's ears, let's hope you're right. And, uh, I hope we'll speak before we, we were able to do that though again. Uh, but I, now I think it's getting late enough in Australia. So I'll just shut up. Is this something that you, you were hoping to talk about, but I failed to bring up? Um, no, I don't think so. I think, um, yeah, I mean, obviously I can go through the market conditions a lot more, but we can do this again time. more, by the way, if you like, I enjoyed this conversation a lot. If you, if you, you know, if you're up to doing this more often, whatever, I'm, I'm definitely open yeah. for it. Uh, learning getting different opinions i really appreciate that so i mean i can share this one chart that i think is quite neat just before we finish off then please so this so this is a pretty interesting chart um and so what it is is this um the supply of money so we've created so the supply of money all the asset classes or most of the main asset classes will eventually have to catch up to the M2 money supply, the rate of growth of M2 money supply. So what this chart it really is, it's pretty hard to see, but what you see the pink line here is the M2 money supply. And what I've done is basically put all the major asset classes against it. And so this is the NASDAQ. <laughs> so it's way overshot above the, the growth of M2 money supply. Um, you've got the Dow Jones, which is almost matching it. You've got gold, surprisingly, which has almost matched it as well. So over time, since 1960, it's almost matching the empty money supply. And what I expect out of this commodities run is an overshoot like this, with, like we've seen back in the 1970s and also in the 2000s. So I do expect the gold to overshoot and perhaps NASDAQ to come down like we've seen back in the 2000s. Um, but what's really interesting is used oil. You know uranium relative to used oil, so oil prices are much more undervalued than uranium. Uh, uranium is much under, much more underpriced right now 
than um, than oil. But what we're seeing with oil, it, for example, is it's sitting way below um, M2 money supply growth rate. So what we've seen back in the 1970s bull run is we've come up above, we've got we've stayed above for a long time, we've shot way above. Back in the 2000s as well, we've shot above it. And I think we'll shoot way above it this time around, given the energy crisis and given the fundamentals. Um, and, and this is US housing price right at the bottom. It's never gone up. And maybe perhaps this time around, it, it might catch up. So yeah, so I wanted to picture that and show you and just visualization of how, how much the energy sector right now is undervalued compared to the rest, compared to the rest. And, and if oil is undervalued against everything else, then imagine how undervalued uranium is right now. Mm. So just wanted to share this.